uh, in this talk, my goal is not to explain how to adapt a plugin to work in the Moodle app. I've done that in the past already. We have documentation for that. What I want you is to convince you to adapt your plugin to work in the Moodle app, or in case you are not a plugin developer, but you work with plugin developers, convince you to convince them to adapt their plugins to the Moodle app. So before I begin, how many of you have developed or contributed with a Moodle plugin? Raise your hands. Three, four, five, six. Yeah, around 10, 11, something like that. Uh, has any of you adapted a plugin to work in the Moodle app? Oh, yeah. More than I expected. I expected two, three. We had like five or six. So yeah, that's nice. So basically, what I want is that you pay a bit less attention to Moodle LMS and also pay attention to the Moodle app. OK? <laughs> So let's begin with the big question. Why? Why should I adapt my plugin to work in the Moodle app? Well, we have approximately 10 million unique users each month. Okay, That's a lot of users. Most of these users will be students, because as you probably know, the app is mostly focused for students. Teachers can use it too, but their features are quite quite limited. You know, you cannot edit courses, you cannot edit activities, you can only grade in assignments. So it's more attractive for students. So we will, we don't have data about this, but we believe that most of those users will be students. And some of them only use the app to access the site, especially in areas with bad internet connection. We know some clients and some people using Moodle that have told us, okay, uh, we work with uh, areas where there is no internet connection, so they download the app when they have Wi-Fi, they download all the material, and then people can use the and do their courses offline, and then when they connect back to the internet, everything is synchronized. So in that case, they cannot use Moodle in a browser. They can only use it in the app. In other cases, there can also be people that they, are, they have internet connection, but they prefer using the app. And if your plugin isn't adapted in the app, they will have to move to the browser to do what they will need to do with your plugin and then move back to the app and having to switch between context causes a bad user experience for the user. So this is how I imagine a plugin developer, okay? He's writing a Moodle plugin, he's confident, he's been writing PHP code for years, maybe even Moodle code, he even teaches other people best practices and so on. So yeah, he's really confident. But you know what's coming now, I guess. <laughs> when he needs to add the, the plugin to the app, he's not so confident anymore. Okay, now he has more doubts, more questions. Maybe he doesn't have as much time to do it. And before I move on, this is just a joke. I hope no one is, no one is offended. I'm actually the opposite one. I'm the strong dog when I wrote code for the app and the weak dog when I wrote code for Moodle LMS. So let's see the main reasons we excuses that we received for not adapting a plugin to the app and what we did to try to improve that. The first one is, I don't know Angular, okay? Moodle is written in PHP, and they use Mustache for the templates, but in the Moodle app, we use a framework called Ionic that it can use different frameworks as a base, like Angular or Vue or React. In our case, we use Angular. So this is a, a small requirement that you need to be able to adapt your plugin. So uh, like Amaya said, I've been working in the Moodle app for many years, al almost 10. And when you've been working so much time in something, you like to talk about history. And that's what I'm going to do now. <laughs> in in 20, uh, 2016, we implemented the first way to support plugins in the app. Okay, it was in the 3.1 version of the app. Before that, plugins didn't work at all. And it was a really powerful system. You know, when you wrote a plugin to work in the app, you could do anything. It was exactly as if you were writing code in the app itself. Okay, as if your plugin was already part of the binary file of the app. Uh, although your code was zipped in a, in a single file and then the app connected to the site, downloaded that file, unzipped it and injected it inside the app you know, next to all the other features. The main problem was that it required a deep knowledge of Angular. In this case, Angular JS, that was Angular 1, the first version. In Angular 2, they, they, they basically 
changed how the framework worked a lot, and now it's called just Angular. When you see Angular JS, it meets the first version of Angular. Just so you can see how it looked like, this is real code from a plugin, the Gapfield plugin uh, developed by Marcos Green, and this was part of the code needed to make it work in the Moodle app. If you haven't used Angular JS before, I guess this looks quite confusing. I work with Angular, and now it also looks a bit confusing for me too. Okay, so what was the reaction from the community, from plugin developers? This one. <laughs> okay, I think only two or three developers adapt their plugins to work in the app. It was Marcus Green, uh, Marcus, yeah, Marcus Green. I think Neil McGill. I, I know, don't know if anyone else did it. So we had a really powerful system, but no one used it, so it was useless. So we decided to implement a new system to have plugins to the app. Two years later, in, in 2018, it's the same system that we currently have. This system is more limited. You cannot do all the things you did before, but it's easier to use. Basically, now what the app does, instead of downloading a zip file with everything, we call a web service to download the templates of your plugin, the HTML that you, we need to display when your plugin is displayed in the app. You don't need to create Angular modules or Angular components or Angular, di Angular directives. You basically need a template and, if needed, some JavaScript code. Uh, in this template, you will probably need to use Angular directives or outputs or, or components and maybe even some of our custom components that we have in the Moodle lab. That's all the Angular knowledge you need to know. So it's way easier than it was before to adapt your plugins. And as I mentioned, in some plug plugins, maybe you need JavaScript to make everything work as you want, but we have some plugins that are working and have no JavaScript at all. All the logic is handled and that, uh, in the template itself. So, second reason, my, tab, but I, uh, my type of plugin isn't supported. Okay? As I mentioned, the app is focused for students, so we don't support every single type of plugin that Moodle supports. So, let's do a list. Uh, we support activities, of course. We support, uh, support availability restrictions. We have an asterisk in there because in case of avail availability restrictions, you know, you can configure when do you want an activity to be available to the student? All this logic is handled at server side. So you don't, need to do, you don't need to do anything to make it work in the app. They work automatically. We support uh, the assignment plugins, both feedback and submission. We support blocks, course formats, course custom fields, another asterisk, because in this case, we display uh, custom fields in the app. But since you cannot edit courses, you cannot edit course custom fields. And they work automatically also. Uh, and I think there are no custom fields with JavaScript. I'm not sure about that. But if you don't have JavaScript, the course custom fields should work automatically in the app. Uh, we support enrollment plugins. This is new, what well, was new in the 4.3 version. It was like a year ago. And this is the main reason why I added this point, because uh, in the past, we had people saying, oh, I want to support my enrollment plugin on the app, but you don't support enrollment plugins. Well, now we do. Uh, we support filters. This is similar as the course custom field that if your filter only uses PHP, it will work in the app automatically. You don't need to adapt it to the app. If you need JavaScript, like, for example, MathJax or the HVLP filters that converts the URL to the package, then you will need to adapt your plugin to work in the app. Uh, notifications, question types, question behaviors, quiz access restrictions, uh, themes. We don't have like an API to support themes, but you can use either the mobile CCS URL feature that we have in the app, or you can also add a return CSS in your plugin to style the app. So indirectly, you can support themes in the app too. Uh, user profile fields. In this case, they will work when you are authenticated and you see a user profile, but plugins only work after a user has authenticated in the app. So if a user is creating a new account through the app, your, the custom fields won't work because since the user hasn't authenticated yet, we cannot download the plugins. So this is a, a limitation about profile fields. And workshop assessment strategies. 
So these are all the plugin types that we support in the app. Uh, this list and the next one that we'll see, it was created using all the categories in the moodle.org slash plugins, you know, that you can filter by categories. All of them are either in this list or in the unsupported plugin types list. So we don't support administration tools. As I mentioned, the app is not for admins, so it doesn't make much, much sense to add admin features in there. But if you want, you can also do a workaround because we allow extending some menus in the app. I will talk about this uh, later. And you can use that to add your own feature, extra feature in the app. So in case it's needed, you can also add it. But we don't have a specific API to support administration tools. We don't support the book tool plugins that I don't even know exactly what they are. It's like for printing books or something like that. Uh, Database fields, this is one that we don't support, but we might support in the future. We're still looking at it. We don't support text editor plugins either. As you know, there are Atto or Tiny plugins. In the app right now, we are using a custom editor. It's really basic, but we are starting to analyze including Tiny MC in the app also. If that works if fine and we end up doing it, we will probably support tiny plugins in the app itself. So if you have a tiny plugin, you will be able to adapt it to work in the app, but not yet. I, don't, I cannot give an estimated time right now about when will this, will this be available. We are, st still, are still starting to work on it. We don't support grading form. Right now, you can only grade in assignments and only using uh, the two basic methods, nothing else. LTI, plagiarism. Again, it's an asterisk, but because some things work, some things automatically, some things don't. So depending on what you are trying to do, maybe they, it works, maybe not. You, you will have to check. But we don't have, again, we don't have a specific API to support plagiarism plugins in the app. We don't support reports, uh, repositories, or since local plugins can be anything, so I, I put it in unsupported, but again, you can extend menus in the app to support local plugins because you can add extra features. So which menus of the app can you extend? The first one, the main menu, as uh, you can see, we have the bottom tabs and the three dots. It's selected. When the user goes to this menu, we call it the more page. And this is all the options that doesn't, don't fit at the bottom. You can add a new option in this list in the position you want. So for example, if you have a separate system uh, like a CMS or something, and you want to add an option to open it, or you want to add new pages in the app, something like that, you can do that adding options here. You cannot add new tabs at the bottom. Okay, Right now, it's not possible. You can only add new options in this more menu. Uh, the home tabs, you see at the top, we have dashboard and site home. You can add a new tab at the top too when the user access like this dashboard option at the bottom. You can also add new course tabs along with courses, participants, grades, competencies, etc. You can also have your own tab in here in the position you want. Uh, again, as you see, the information action, uh, button at the top, if you click it, this model is open and you can also add new options in here. Uh, in the user profile field, you can also add new options in the, when you are viewing either your own profile or another user profile. And finally, you can also add new options in the app preferences. So next reason, I don't know how to start. I mean, I'm a plugin developer. I know PHP, but this process is completely different, and I don't know what should I do to start. So first of all, read the documentation, like always, read the manual. That's always the first advice. We recently changed the documentation about plugins. Before, we had a really long page with a lot of information. Now we try to restructure it a bit, uh, split it into different pages so it's easier to, to follow. Uh, if you scan the QR code, you will open this, this URL. Also, we have in the Moodle plugins uh, repository, we have a batch that we give to plugins that have been adapted to the Moodle app with this link you will see this list, the list of plugins that have this batch. You can use that to see similar plugins to yours. So you can look at examples of what can you do to make your plugin work in the Moodle app. And the advices are basically the same as when you try to develop something new. If you are not sure how to start first, hello world, always. 
just create a template with a hello world, create all, all the files needed to return that, just that, don't add any extra feature. And that way you will be able to test that at least the foundations of your plugin work in the Moodle app, that you at least you have configured everything correctly to return your template to the Moodle app. On, once you have that, you can start adding functionality. Uh, modify your template, add more options. In, uh, in the PHP file that returns the template, you can start adding more logic to retrieve all the information needed to render your plugin, all that stuff. But it's better to keep adding it bit by bit because if you make something wrong, if you, if you make a mistake, it will be easier to detect where is the problem. Uh, like I said, try to find similar examples. If there's already an activity or a blog or something that behaves similar to what you want to achieve, uh, use it as an example. Uh, if you have a developer question, we have the dev chat. It's only for developer questions. It's not for support questions, okay? And uh, me or my team, we usually look at the chat. If, if there are any app-related questions, we always try to, to answer them. And if you have a support question, not a, not a developer one, or you can post it in this forum. It's the Moodle for mobile forum. And we also try to keep a look at it, but we usually answer faster in the, in the dev chat. So uh, when we develop the app, we usually test the features first in a browser, in a web app, because it's faster for us to recompile and everything. But before publishing your plugin, always remember to test in real devices, both, both in Android and in iOS, because sometimes some things don't behave exactly as in the browser, especially if you're working with files or camera or things like that. Uh, all the information about testing in web app or in browser, uh, in browser or in devices, and so it's also in the in the documentation I mentioned earlier. Bonus points: we had tests. You can add behad test to, uh, on your plugin to test that it works fine in in the app. All these tests run in the web app. It doesn't run, they don't run in a real device. So depending on what you need to test, maybe you cannot use them. But it's really recommended to write them because if we do something that breaks your plugin, you will be able to detect it. Uh, if sometimes something that happens, I, I think it's the same in LMS. Sometimes you change something, you refresh, oh, nothing happens. Remember, pull the Moodle catches, restart the app, and perform a pull to refresh when you are seeing your plugin. The, uh, these three steps usually work to get the latest data. Depending on what you are doing, for example, if you only change the template of your plugin and it's an activity, for example, doing a pull to refresh will automatically update it. But if you are changing something in the mobile.php file, then you need to push caches and restart the app. That's why I decided to boot them all. And in case of needed, do this all three and the information should be updated in the app. And the last reason, okay, I have that in my plugin, but now I need to maintain it. And maybe I don't have time to do it. We are in the app. We are really careful with breaking changes. Every time we change a function that we know that's being used uh, in a plugin, uh, we usually extend the time uh, for removing. It. We follow a similar process as in LMS that when we need to change a public API, we deprecate the function first, and then like two years later, approximately, we remove it. If we detect that there are still plugins using it, we extend it. We've done that in the past, and we will continue to do it in the in the future. So far, the only significant breaking changes uh, for plugins were caused by Ionic upgrades. These are breaking changes that we cannot control. Ionic changed the stuff that you are using, so you need to update your your plugin. And it, like I mentioned, we released this system in 2018, and it only happened twice. Uh, when it happened, in both cases, we decided to send pull requests to the affected plugins. In the first time, it was 20 pull requests. The second time, the, uh, this year, we sent 18 pull requests to plugins to fix their templates. Uh, these breaking changes uh, uh, for uh, Ionic were only UA, UI issues, so, like things that didn't look properly, but all the logic continued to work. And the most important thing about this is we might not do the same in the future. Okay, I don't want this to happen, okay? We did in the past because we had time, but maybe in the future we don't have time to do it, especially because we have more and more plugins adapted to the app, so it's more work for us to send pull requests to fix the plugins. So let's finish with 
what we did and what we are planning to do. Uh, in this last year, like I mentioned, we support enrollment plugins. We also revamped the documentation, like I also mentioned. There are more plugins supported to work in the app. For example, the checklist plugin, both the activity and the blog. And also recently, uh, Read Speaker, the certified partner, they also uh, adapted the plugin to work in the Moodle app. I saw the announcement today, so it's something really, really recent. So now we have even more examples to, to look at. In case of Read Speaker, it's quite a complex plugin. So I guess in most cases, won't be a useful example for you because he does uh, complex stuff like injecting extra scripts for doing things. So maybe that's not the best example, but it's there. Uh, and then some uh, specific issues like uh, this component that is for activities. It was introduced in the app 4.0, but there was a bug uh, when plugins tried to use it, we fixed that, so now you can use it. And then some minor improvements, mostly about the, the, uh, the information we pass to the plugin JavaScript and how to update, catch data in background, and so on. So what are we planning to do now? Uh, one of the issues that we are evaluating is uh, Mobile 3730, that is that uh, the CSS returned by plugins should only be applied to the plugins page. Right now, if you have an activity, for example, you can return some CSS to style the course page or the user profile or anything in the app. That doesn't make much sense, okay? It's better to keep it in its own scope. So this is something we want to change, but since this is a breaking change for plugins, we are keeping it slow. We want to uh, warn plugins in advance so they have time to adapt their, their CSS. Also, real specific we want to change how to use the apps api for example in this case the sites provider before everything well right now everything if you want to use a service of the app you need to use this this dot whatever and call the function this looks a bit ugly and also it's not how we do it in the app so we want to change it so you don't have to put the this word but this is also a breaking change for plugins so uh, we decided to delay the, uh, delay this a bit and do it with the next step, that is limit the API available for plugins. When we designed this API, we decided, okay, let's plugin have access to everything. And this is a problem uh, for us because it means that the more public API we have, the more restrictions we have to modify it. Because every time we want to change a function, we need to deprecate it and follow the process and so on. And also for you, because the more services you have in the context, the more information you need to look at in the more complexity you have in your plugin. So our idea is to limit this API. And for example, it doesn't make sense if you have an activity that you have access to the services of choice, activity, or wiki, or quiz, and so on. So we want to limit that. And that's it. I'm on time. So <laughs> yeah. So time for questions. Anybody has any questions? Test. <clears throat> okay. Um, thank you for opening the pull request that you have on the <laughs> plugin that we maintain. I really do appreciate that. As far as communicating the changes, I understand what you're saying about not necessarily being able to fix all the plugins in the future. So how will you keep especially plugin developers in the loop so that we can be a little bit more proactive instead of forcing essentially forcing you to be reactive and opening pull requests to fix our code yeah uh when we do a change that will break plugins or not even plugins maybe when we increase the requirements of the app for example if we don't want to support android 5 anymore things like that we usually publish it in the Moodle for mobile forum okay uh, so we will op if we want to do a breaking change, and I guess we will also post it in the dev chat, you know, to make it more make people more aware about if we are going to open a pull request or not. In most times, we don't know it until we have implemented it and we see uh, the amount of work that requires to do it. But in any case, what we will do for sure is at least have a couple of examples of what needs to be fixed, so plugins can look at it and say, okay. Uh, if I'm using this directive, I need to change it for this one and this kind of stuff. In the case of the Ionic 
change, breaking changes, they also released like an upgrade guide with all the steps to follow. And that's what I used to open the pull request. So in, if we want plugin developers to do that, we will also publish that information so they can follow the guide and make it easier for you. Thank you. I'll just follow that up. Um, uh, Moodle forums are great, they're noisy. Yeah. Um, is there another alternative way we can target just hearing about news specific to mobile changes that a developer would need to change so that we can make sure that we cut through some of that noise? Yeah. Right now, I think we don't have any other channel to communicate that. Important announcements, we usually pin them, so they are always at the top of the forum. But yeah, if you, you want to know if there's something new, I think right now we don't have any other channel. But yeah, I can also tell Juan, maybe we can create something. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, any other question? Yeah, at the back. It may sound silly, but uh, we are totally new to these uh, plugins. But uh, what really uh, made us to think is that there are certain things that are specific to our university. And we thought one way of uh, achieving that uh, is that just uh, modify the Moodle code or the other alternative ways, uh, develop a plugin, something like this. But my question is, uh, when you develop a plugin, okay, you go through the documentation, you go through all of that, but then how do you, how does it uh, relate to the compatibility when the next Moodle 4.5 and then it, it goes on? So how every time when there is a new release, uh, we got to revisit the code and things like that. I, I just want to know. Thank you. Uh, well, in case of the template, uh, in general, it won't be broken at all when you upgrade a uh, model because it just uses uh, Angular and the apps directive. So they are not related to Moodle code and the template should be fine. About PHP, uh, yeah, maybe sometimes it can be broken. For example, when they, uh, when Andrew refactored how the web service layer changed, if you have web services in your plugin used by the app, then maybe you need to adapt your web services to use the, to change the imports and so on. So that's why one of the reasons why BHAT tests are important. That way, when a new Moodle release comes out, you run the BHAT test. If it works, everything is okay. Yeah. Okay. So I think it's time. Uh, yep. Yeah, I have okay. a very quick question. Um, I've experienced this thing before to make some of my plugins mobile compatible, which I was lazy to do. But just a quick question about that. Um, I know some of the cores were Angular. And for Moodle Docs, we have our own policies and procedures like intercomponent communication, coding standards, stuff like that. Is there any policy document or is will there be any policy to follow the developers uh, while implementing or while making your plugin mobile friendly? Because when I work on a plugin, I can just do whatever I want, right? But following Moodle's policy, procedure, and coding style. But while I'm writing those angulars and so some of the stuffs, and obviously the template and mustache should be different, right? So is there any policy and procedure a developer should, I think they should follow something while doing that because it's kind of an independent task, right? Yeah, right now we don't have any guide about policies. We have a guide about best practices, but it mostly applies to Angular code and the app code. So it's not something that most plugins, plugin developers won't need that. Uh, so uh, in general, since we, when we implemented the system, we already also implemented a few plugins like the course certificate. Now we have the checklist that I did also. So in general, looking at other examples, you will see a bit of what you should do. But uh, like you said, uh, you can do anything, but in, in templates, it's a bit more limited. In what we always say is that everything what we uh, make available for plugins, we consider it a, a, a public API. So if it's available for you, you can use it, but we don't have any best practices of what you should do, at least for now. We can maybe create one in the future. <laughs>